I am, uh, for the benefit of those in the room, as well as whoever may be watching, I am Kathleen Howell, an Associate Dean for Engineering. I'm here to welcome everyone on behalf of Dean Jameson to this event. So this celebration of faculty careers actually emerged from a strategic plan about five years ago. And at that time, it was called the Faculty of 2020, and the focus was on professional development at all stages of the faculty members. It was also interested in aligning at that time the hiring uh, and promotion and tenure process as the college scope was evolving and its leadership values were, were being brought forward. So there was a desire for a post uh, uh, review of uh, full professors um, that would include the feature of having an understanding of the accomplishments of everyone at this particular time in their career and an opportunity to make any plans going forward. So full professors who are at least seven years past promotion present this type of colloquia on their achievements and their plans. And then following this, they get the opportunity for a meeting with their head as well as with the dean. So the program was originally piloted in 2013, and we're now entering about the fourth year of actually running the program. So today we have the opportunity to celebrate Professor Saul uh, Gelfin, and he completed his PhD at MIT in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Prior to coming to Purdue, he was with Scientific Systems Incorporated in Cambridge, as well as Bolt, uh, Baranek, and yes. Newman in Cambridge. So he's been here since 1987, and as you all know, is currently a professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering. His interests lie broadly in modeling analysis and optimization of stochastic systems and uh, signals and systems, and his research is in the areas of digital communication, statistical signal processing, optimization, and pattern recognition. So with that, going forward, we then let you tell the rest of the story. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just wanted to say that I was a little bit unclear how to structure this talk, so I decided to talk about things which um, sort of maybe I'm most proud of, and uh, uh, also what I'm currently interested in, and maybe just overview some of the other uh, things rather uh, briefly. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so this is an outline of the talk, and uh, so I'll first be talking about uh, stochastic sampling and optimization. This is actually work that grew out of my PhD thesis at MIT, but was done the uh, uh, primarily by me when I came to Purdue. So the first topic is stochastic sampling. So um, Markov chain sampling methods, also known as Markov chain Monte Carlo or CMC, are a, a basic tool for Bayesian statistical inference, things like uh, MMSC, a map estimation, uh, imputation, validation, those kinds of things. Uh, the idea is to sample from a Markov chain with a desired invariant distribution. And uh, this idea was due to Metropolis, but there's been a tremendous amount of work subsequently, uh, many other related techniques, some suitable for parallel implementation. A related approach, which is uh, perhaps not as well known, is sampling from diffusions, or stochastic SDE, stochastic differential equation. And there are discrete time approximations. So that's for sampling uh, in uh, in Euclidean space. Okay, so uh, we examine the relationship between Markov chain and diffusion sampling algorithms, and what we showed is that these inter suitably interpolated Markov chain sampling methods converge weakly to uh, what's called a Langevin diffusion, which is uh, like a Brownian motion or a Wiener process, except there is a viscosity term. Um, Furthermore, we showed that different types of uh, Markov chains from different sampling methods, like the uh, Metropolis and the heat bath method, they converge to diffusions running at different time scales. And so this is a way of comparing the different methods, uh, something people were really uh, uh, able to do previous to that. Now, a different approach, and one which you know, one might take, if, uh, certainly would be to look at the, uh, the modulus of the second largest eigenvalue, the transition matrices, but it, Actually, that's a very difficult thing to, uh, to get a handle on.
Okay, so uh, so here's a display of our Markov chain sampling method. Um, so anyway, the idea is this. Um, uh, it has a transition density P of XY, which you get from sort of a candidate transition density Q of XY. So starting at X, uh, you, you get Y from Q of XY, and then you accept it with probability S of XY. And if you don't accept, uh, you stay at the same place X. So uh, this uh, P of XY expression um, does that. Now, the acceptance probability differs for different uh, Markov chain sampling methods. For the Metropolis method, uh, S is equal to this SM. For the uh, heat bath method, S is equal to SH. And there are others as well. Okay. So how did we, uh, or what did we show, you know, what is this convergence of this Markov chain sampling method to a diffusion? Well, we parameterize a Markov chain by a small parameter, epsilon. And uh, it has a transition density, uh, Q epsilon. And uh, the way this works, remember, we're, we're doing things in continuous space. So it selects a coordinate at random, and then it performs or selects a Gaussian perturbation with mean zero and variance epsilon. And then we interpolate that into continuous time to get this X epsilon. And what we showed was under suitable conditions, this uh, interpolated process, X epsilon, converges to a Langevin diffusion. Uh, depending upon the, uh, the Markov chain sampling method, for example, for the Metropolis method, it converges to this XM. And for the heat bath method, it converges to XH. And uh, if you know a little bit about stochastic differential equations and diffusions, um, it turns <coughs> out that XM is running at twice the speed of XH. So uh, in this sense, Metropolis runs at twice the speed of the heat bath and would, would therefore be so this was, uh, this was a, new, uh, a new result. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is stochastic optimization. So uh, stochastic approximation is a basic tool for root finding and uh, optimization under uncertainty. And it's a generalization of the classical uh, nonlinear local search uh, methods. So for optimization, typically, and that's what we're interested in here, typically one performs a gradient or a, a Newton-type step. But the estimates which are used to get the gradient and Hessian uh, approximations to them uh, are uh, noisy or imprecise measurements. And so we get what's called stochastic gradient or stochastic Newton algorithms. And these were initially developed by Robbins and Monroe and Kiefer Wolfowitz, and there's been a, uh, a lot of analysis and application of these methods. I should say that the decreasing step size approach is used for the fixed parameter identification. If we use a fixed step size, we can track uh, time-varying parameters. Okay, so what we did was we uh, developed and analyzed uh, what I'll call a globally optimal stochastic gradient algorithm um, under fairly general conditions. And we also developed and analyzed continuous state Markov chain annealing algorithm, which is kind of a different type of algorithm, uh, also used for global optimization. And we did it by writing the, the annealing algorithm in the form of this uh, globally optimal stochastic gradient. So this, this, again, is based on this connection that we developed between the Markov chain sampling methods and the diffusions. And then we applied uh, this stuff also to several uh, global optimization problems, including uh, edge detection, and uh, uh, virus reconstruction. In the latter case, we actually looked at a lot of other global optimization methods as well and compared them. OK, so here's the classical stochastic gradient. It looks like a uh, steepest descent algorithm, but it has this noise, psi k. Uh, and a k is a sequence of positive numbers. In the modern analysis, there's usually two steps to analyzing these types of things. One is you establish some kind of global stability property, like a boundedness, using a uh, foster Lyapunov criteria. And then you characterize the limit points from uh, this is what's called an associated ordinary differential equation, which is little z of t, uh, which is obtained by averaging the, uh, the stochastic gradient algorithm. And under suitable conditions, you can show that um, with a k, say, going to 0 like 1 over k, 
that this uh, ZK converges to the set S, which is the local minima of U. Um, it converges with probability 1. So what we did was we modified the stochastic grading algorithm by uh, adding in this BKWK term here, this thing. And this is sort of um, done to escape the local minima. So the, uh, everything's the same as before, except the WK are, are standard independent Gaussian random variables, and the BK is a sequence which goes to zero very, very slowly. Again, the analysis is, is done in two steps. They're sort of guided by the ODE method and the uh, classical stochastic gradient algorithm. We establish a global uh, stability property, in this case, tightness or sort of boundedness and probability. And then we characterize the limit points from what's called an associated, what I call an associated SDE, stochastic differential equation. And under suitable conditions, with this uh, BK, again, going to zero very, very slowly, like uh, constant over square root K log log K, uh, and also B over A being greater than C, Z zero, which is some constant which comes out of analyzing this diffusion. Uh, using the uh, uh, Friedland eventual large deviations theory. That xk actually converges to the set of global minima, even in the presence of uh, strict local minima. The convergence is in probability. The analysis here is a lot more delicate than the, the uh, classical approach with the OD uh, because of this very slowly decreasing noise. You have to localize the uh, approximation and the stochastic differential equation on very, very long time intervals, um, but, uh, but it can be done. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is uh, pattern recognition and machine learning. So the first thing here is, is iterative growing and pruning of classification trees. So uh, classification trees are an important method for non-parametric classification. The trees are usually grown top-down. Um, by splitting features in the feature vector until uh, some termination criteria. We label the terminal nodes with the uh, class labels. There's many advantages to these approaches, to this, this tree structured approach. Uh, an important one is interpretability, meaning you know, how does the classifier work? What features does it select? Uh, what order does it select them? What are the, uh, the thresholds? Uh, so it's used not just for predictive analysis, but also for feature extraction. Um, okay, here's a classification tree. Uh, X is the uh, feature vector. Uh, F is the splitting function. Theta is the threshold. Uh, C hats and the terminal nodes are the labels. So, uh, you know, a feature vector propagates down the tree. It gets no labeled as the class of the terminal node that it lands in. Oops. Okay. Um, cart growing and pruning. So uh, to avoid overfitting, which is a critical thing in uh, not just classification but uh, regression, um, Bryman, Friedman, Olshin, and Stone, as a part of their famous cart classification and regression tree program, suggested growing a large tree and pruning it back rather than using uh, stopping criteria. This kind of a global approach as opposed to a local approach, which would be the stopping criteria. So you, you grow the large tree until the terminal nodes are pure, that is, they contain members only from a single class, after which there's no point to continue splitting. Then CART minimizes a what's called a complexity cost over the pruned subtrees. These are subtrees with the same root <coughs> node. See, if you label all the nodes in the tree with some class, and each pruned subtree is actually a classifier itself. And selecting a, a pruned subtree is like selecting a less complex, less overfitted uh, classifier. So they, anyway, they minimize this complexity cost over all the pruned subtrees, um, over the pruned subtrees for all possible values of the complexity parameter, and then find the complexity parameter using cross-validation. And they give a very interesting and efficient algorithm uh, perfor for performing the, uh, the minimization over the uh, prune subtrees. So I want to talk about it a little bit because uh, you know, we generalize this for the name Pearson approach. So um, 
R of T here is the misclassification rate of a classification tree based on training data set. And um, this will be a, a, a very uh, biased uh, estimate be, um, because uh, the, the estimation is done on the, the same data which is used to grow the tree. So it needs to be penalized to eliminate the bias. So um, this complexity cost R alpha is introduced. And uh, T tilde here is the uh, set of terminal nodes, and alpha is the complexity parameter. So as I said, CART grows this full tree and then finds the optimally pruned subtree, which minimizes this complexity cost. And they do this by proving the existence of and then determining an efficient algorithm a defined uh, thresholds alpha k and pruned subtrees tk such that this t0 of alpha is, the, is equal to this fixed pruned subtree tk when alpha is in this alpha k interval. So the whole problem is finite, so you would expect something like this. So the, the issue is, you know, how do you actually find the alpha k's and, and tk's? And, and that's uh, what they gave uh, an efficient algorithm to do. Okay, then you find alpha star and, the, uh, and T star, the optimally pruned subtree, by minimizing the, the, uh, the misclassific an estimate of misclassification rate based on cost validation. So what we did, uh, well, I should say CART, so if you want to think about what CART does, CART uses cost validation or tests it to find an optimally pruned subtree amongst a parametric family. So reducing this to a problem of parameter estimation of, of pruned subtrees. We instead propose to find optimally pruned subtrees amongst all subtrees using all the data in, in, uh, in iterative growing and pruning phases. So we had no need for complexity parameters here. And uh, we did that by uh, splitting the data set and uh, iteratively growing and pruning based on all remaining subsets and establishing conversions. So the key thing was to get the thing set up in a way that, that it actually converged. And then we also gave an efficient algorithm for the pruning phase. So here's a, uh, an example. This is from uh, the CART uh, monograph on uh, problem waveform classification. They use this problem extensively uh, to uh, examine their results and compare them with other methods. Um, so in the, in the top table, um, we have the CART and the proposed method. And the, uh, what you can see is that um, so uh, the number of terminal nodes, um, that's the first, is about the same for the two methods. The estimate of the risk based on cost validation is less for the proposed method. And the actual risk is less as well. Okay? We know the actual risk because we have the model. We can compute it. Furthermore, the CPU requirement is dramatically less because this uh, generation of the parametric family pruned subtrees turns out to be very computationally expensive. The, the lower uh, table shows the iterations in the proposed method. It actually just takes uh, three iterations. Um, actually, even after the first iteration, it's doing better than CART. However, um, it's difficult to determine which pruning method or more generally classification tree design is, is better. Uh, the results problem dependent. This is a very active area of, insert, of research that's been going on at least 30 years. Now there are new methods, um, things called bagging and boosting and random forest, which use ensembles. And the goal is to have improved prediction over a single tree. So you can kind of compare ensembles with uh, pruning, where you generate a single tree. And uh, However, okay, single trees are still widely used uh, for feature selection and because they can be interpreted. This was what I was, what I was talking about before. Um, you know, how does the classifier work? This is actually very important to people who use these things uh, and don't just want a black box. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is name and Pearson classification trees. Okay, uh, so classification trees are usually done using Bayesian approach minimize the misclassification loss or Bayes risk in the various phases. The frequentless approach is handled by basically uh, arbitrarily selecting some class prior values to generate some suboptimal and incomplete subset of the receiver operating characteristic. It's sort of a crude application of what's called the name and Pearson number. We propose an approach to generate the entire optimally labeled and pruned uh, ROC 
which would then yield the name and Pearson design, and actually other things too, like Minimax, as well as uh, the area under the ROC curve, which is a popular uh, method to compare um, classifiers in uh, the machine learning and statistics community. So we minute we propose to min or to minimize the what's called a what we call a prior complexity cost or a prior parameterized complexity cost over the prune subtrees and also the terminal labels because they change when the priors change. For all possible values of the priors and complexity, then find the complexity parameter using cross validation, then extract the receiver operating characteristic. So by comparison, CART just minimizes the complexity cost. So it's sort of a one-dimensional thing, whereas we have a two-dimensional thing. So we get a geometric aspect to the problem which wasn't there in CART. So we give an efficient algorithm for doing this, and uh, it turns out that the CART algorithm is really uh, kind of a special and, and much simpler case. So uh, here's a display of a little more detail of what's going on. So we let PD and PF be the detection of false alarm probabilities. They're parameterized now by the prior uh, gamma of class zero in this two class problem. So now the prior parameterized cost, uh, complexity cost is this R alpha gamma. And we are minimizing this over all the prune subtrees. And what we show, we, we demonstrate the existence and then actually determine an efficient algorithm to find uh, what turns out to be convex polygons PK such that the optimally pruned subtree is equal to some fixed prune subtree TK whenever alpha gamma is in one of these convex polygons. So we then find alpha star of gamma and the optimally pruned subtree is a function of gamma, the prior uh, using uh, uh, minimizing over alpha using cross validation. And then we can get the ROC curve by varying gamma. That will generate the whole ROC, ROC curve. And then we can uh, find oh, the, the ROC region, I guess you can say. And then uh, we can find the ROC curve by finding the boundary of the convex hole. Um, so it actually kind of surprises me this whole thing could be done. Okay. And, uh, but, but, I think, but I think we've done it. So this is an experiment, a uh, credit assessment experiment. This is from the famous uh, uh, UCR machine learning database. Um, so you're trying to determine from some training data set uh, whether somebody's credit worthy or not. That is the plus or minus. This is the full tree I was talking about. <coughs> so this is the full tree and we want to find uh, the ROC curve of optimally pruned subtrees or randomizations which yield it. Okay, so the, uh, the figure on the left uh, is the alpha gamma space with the, uh, the uh, convex polygons, each representing where a particular prune subtree is optimal. And the figure on the right is a magnified view of the lower right corner. You can see these convex polygons here. And uh, most of the action seems to be going on in that corner. There's actually 190 of these convex polygons corresponding to 190 optimally pruned subtrees uh, that we generate, which, we'll, which we then use. Uh, we, find, we estimate the um, the probably detection false alarm for each of those. That's the figure on the left. And then um, we extract the, uh, uh, the, con the boundary of the convex hull. That's the figure on the right. So th this, this algorithm which we've determined to do this is actually quite interesting. There's some uh, uh, linear programming subproblems that need to be solved. Um, uh, but it, but it, it seems to work. OK, next thing I want to talk about is incremental and adaptive regression trees. So regression trees, like classification trees, are an important method for non-parametric and non-linear regression. Um, the trees are constructed like classification trees. Conventionally, there's just a continuous response value at each of the terminal nodes. But we're actually going to use a multiple linear regression. We could use a generalized linear model even uh, at each node because um, we want to actually do piecewise linear regression or piecewise linear filtering. Um, there's various methods to uh, define the regressions, the split points, and the prunings. Again, uh, like classification tree, um, these can be used for prediction, also variable selection, ranking, association, um, all those things. So uh, incremental and adaptive regression trees. This is what, uh, what we worked on. Um, 
Inter incrementally designed and adaptive regression trees are important when additional data becomes available or um, the data is not stationary. Because you, know, you don't want to rebuild the whole tree, especially in some deep learning problem with a big data set. That's not practical. And of course, that wouldn't work if the data is not stationary and you're trying to track it. Uh, in the literature, people use heuristics for this. There's no analysis. Um, so the basic problem that you have to come to grips with here is that even with stationary independent data, strong assumptions, uh, that the data at the, you know, at the, the non-root nodes has a very complex non-stationary and dependent character because you know, the splitting is changing at the nodes due to the new data coming. So um, what we did was we developed uh, MMSE fixed gain stochastic gradient algorithms, and also adaptive pruning algorithms. The whole thing is adaptive. And we actually were de able to demonstrate the convergence and specifically uh, how it's related uh, to, the, to the tree depth. And this actually guided us in, in, in how to formulate the algorithm. And I, I'm actually very proud of this work. Uh, this we. Uh, we developed some new ideas about analyzing hierarchically you know, structured uh, stochastic gradient algorithms. And uh, we also applied it to, to some uh, nonlinear echo cancellation and equalization problems. Here's, a, here's an example of the equalization of the sphere ISI channel. So on, uh, these are learning curves. Um, so on the left plot, the uh, this is the tree structure approach. As you move up, you get the linear uh, equalizer. Then you get a polynomial of second order and then a polynomial of third order. And on the right plot, uh, this is the asymptotic uh, error rate, probability of error. You get the, uh, on the bottom, best performing is the uh, tree structured approach. Then the uh, third order polynomial, second order polynomial. Linear equalizer, linear equalizer actually has an error floor. So what we see is from both the point of view of uh, convergence rate and uh, asymptotic error rate, the tree structure approach works better. Now the obvious thing is to use a polynomial equalizer. The reason that doesn't work is because to, you know, to get, you have to use enough, a high enough order uh, polynomial scheme uh, to get enough approximation capability, but then there's so many terms that it slows down the rate of convergence. And so you could pick terms offline, and people do that, but that wouldn't be suitable for uh, an adaptive implementation. OK, the next thing I want to talk about is, uh, and still in this pattern recognition machine learning area, is multilayer neural networks. So multilayer neural networks are a basic tool for nonparametric classification and regression, very popular in, uh, in the current uh, deep learning craze. Um, Multilayer neural networks consists of weighted linear summations and nonlinear activation function units arranged in a feedforward network. There's other types of networks, uh, recurrent networks, um, convolutional networks, uh, which are, uh, but these are still popular. Okay, uh, these multilayer neural networks, feedforward networks, are, are classically trained with what's called the, the Weibo's backpropagation algorithm, which is actually a stochastic gradient algorithm. Again. You know, the field has progressed quite a bit since this work, and there's, there are new methods. There is uh, um, sort of uh, pre-training at hidden layers, which are not input or output layers, and there's um, unsupervised feature selection at hidden layers. But the backpropagation algorithm is still the primary tool for training these type of networks, especially fine-tuning them, even in the deep learning. So here's a multilayer neural network. The, the, uh, at the top is a neuron. Uh, the activation functions that circle there at the top are, uh, these are some examples. The sigmoid is the classically popular one. There are some others that are uh, increasingly popular now. And at the bottom, we have the, uh, a two-layer, one hidden layer, multi-layer uh, net, feed-forward neural net with um, both multiple inputs and, and outputs. Okay, so what we did um, was the analysis of this, and I'll try to explain why, why what we did uh, was anything but sort of uh, just uh, ap applying the, the usual theory. So the backpropagation is widely applied, but the analysis is difficult because it's a complex nonlinear stochastic system. 
The standard analysis actually uses uh, averaging to determine associate OD, and then you linearize around a Cannon equilibrium point to get some kind of local uh, asymptotic stability for the, uh, the original, um, for the average system, and then uh, as well for the, uh, the backpropagation algorithm itself. But it turns out the analysis does not explain the qualitative behavior due to the nonlinearity, which has been observed over time um, with the backpropagation, which is that there's a long-term dependence on the initial condition, and there's also a drifting of the weights. So we did something different. We analyzed backpropagation using a, a separate and statistical linearization of each activation unit. This is like what's called the describing function method in uh, nonlinear systems analysis. So the algorithm, unlike this class, the conventional approach where you linearize the whole mean vector field, okay, the algorithm is still nonlinear and it reflects the mean behavior more accurately. This approach yielded an associated OD. It turns out it had an unbounded manifold of equilibrium. And we showed that the trajectories of the OD are bounded and converge to that manifold. Uh, we could not use the, uh, the Oppenhoff theory. We had to use LaSalle's theory for this. Um, and I should also point out that uh, the convergence does not imply boundedness here because the, the manifold is of infinite extent. Okay, and then we empirically, we confirmed that the backpropagation mean vector field actually had such a manifold and, and, uh, and there was this dependence on the initial conditions and drift along the manifold. So what I've shown here uh, for a very simple um, two-layer net, I think just a single input and output, so there's two weights, but it illustrates the general theory. I've shown some uh, equilibrium and uh, trajectory. So the equilibria for the, uh, the average backpropagation algorithm are these sort of hyperbolic looking things. And, uh, and for the, uh, the quasi linearized thing, where the, you linearize, you statistically linearize each activation unit, uh, we have similar equilibrium. And also, the trajectories are pretty similar. And in fact, uh, it does predict this type of uh, weight drifting that, um, depending upon the initial conditions, the uh, back propagation kind of contacts or approaches this uh, equilibrium manifold in different places and then subsequently drifts along it. And as far as I know, we are the only ones to have uh, done this kind of analysis and to actually explain the, uh, this qualitative behavior. Okay. Um, keep an eye on that. Okay, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, LMS algorithms. So um, adaptive algorithms are approached to predicting and estimating some unknown single or identifying or approximating some unknown model parameters. Uh, the identification and approximation things are not actually exactly the same thing. We don't really need a model. Okay? In fact, we don't operate mostly in that setting. Uh, I guess we're more in the approximation setting. Anyway, there's some subtle differences there. but. Uh, the most well-known and widely used adaptive algorithm for MMSC linear estimation is stochastic gradient algorithm called uh, least mean squares, or LMS. There's many applications of this um, when low complexity linear estimation is appropriate. And what we did was we investigated uh, several fundamental algorithmic and uh, theoretical problems uh, motivated by practical issues using a constructive approach. And what do I mean by constructive approach? A non-constructive approach um, is the following. Uh, you sort of make very weak assumptions on the data, and you show something like there exists a step size sequence or, or a step size with some desirable asymptotic property. But it doesn't say you know, how big is the step size, or there really aren't useful details about the asymptotic property. Um, in the constructive approach, we make strong assumptions on the data, maybe stationary data stationary independent data, even stationary independent and Gaussian data. And we actually can derive um, bounds on the step size and other information, uh, practical information, about the performance of the algorithm. And then what you can do is you can do simulation to validate uh, that the algorithm kind of works this way even when the data doesn't obey such strong assumptions. So, you know, this is kind of a a useful approach for, uh, for engineering. So here's the, uh, the LMS formulation and algorithm. Uh, 
So y hat is this uh, regression on, on x. x is the regressor. We minimize the mean square. There's also a tracking problem where the data is non-stationary. And then I've shown the LMS algorithm at the bottom here. Alpha is the, uh, is the step size. So the first uh, uh, contribution I want to talk is what's about is called noise constraint LMS. So it turns out that in some problems, the expected form performance can be estimated. For example, in wireless communication systems, you know, assuming that the, uh, uh, the actual channel is in the model set, uh, automatic gain control is used, and the performance is actually just the noise power. And this is essentially known. So this actually is the case in uh, CDMA networks where there's certain types of special signaling. Is, special signaling is done to monitor the, uh, the signal to noise ratio. So what we did is we proposed using this information and an adaptive, constrained MMSC optimization to improve the uh, performance of uh, LMS. It's more general than that. This methodology can be used to include components of model-based information into adaptive algorithms and so interpolate between sort of fully adaptive algorithms, very simple algorithms typically, and fully model-based algorithms. So this is sort of a different approach. Instead of assuming there's a model, you know, and then, well, maybe I don't really know the model, so you scale the model back and things like that, we're starting at the bottom and adding model-based information uh, to a fully adaptive algorithm. So uh, in the noise-constrained minimum mean square, uh, or performance constrained minimum mean square linear estimation problem, what we do is we minimize a Lagrangian, uh, which is formed from the, uh, the mean square and the constraint. And then this is the critical thing. We penalize, and this sign turns out to be important, we penalize the multiplier. Now, why do we do that? Okay, well, the penalty term is added in, since otherwise it turns out the critical values uh, are non unique and actually therefore unbounded, or non-unique and unbounded. In particular, the multiplier is non-unique and unbounded, and that creates problems uh, with an adaptive algorithm. So by uh, subtracting this uh, penal, uh, penalty term, penalizing the multiplier, we get a uh, unique critical value, which turns out actually to be a saddle point. So since it's a saddle point, we can't use steep uh, stochastic gradient. We have to use what's called Robbins-Monroe algorithm. But we can do it and adaptively uh, solve for uh, the solution of what we'll call a multiplier penalized constrained MMSC problem, which is this, this algorithm. It's a type of variable step size on this algorithm, alpha k, which turns out to be data dependent. So for stationary independent uh, Gaussian data, we did a rigorous analysis of this and showed the MCLMS weights and multipliers were bounded to mean square. Actually, this led us to look at the general problem of analyzing um, LMS-type algorithms with uh, data-dependent step size, which was something also had been done. And I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, we also performed an approximate analysis that showed that uh, the NCLMS algorithm achieved larger convergence rates and smaller asymptotic MSC. And even in the case where there was mismatch, where we hadn't estimated the performance correctly, the sigma squared, in the constraint, there was still an performance gain. We were able to show actually that it was best to uh, overestimate. So uh, here's an example of uh, the identification of an ISI channel. These are learning curves for the third channel tap. Um, so the best performing is, is actually, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's this. this is recursive least squares, which is a much more complex algorithm. Next to it is the uh, NCLMS. And then the, uh, the other algorithms are various types of variable step size LMS, which were uh, based mostly on heuristics, unlike the kind of principal derivation we gave, uh, which are in the literature. And the worst performing is the, uh, yeah, the worst performing is the, uh, the LMS here. Okay. Uh, so the third topic, or the second topic, I guess, in, in least mean squares type adaptive algorithms is our 
is a general analysis of variable step size elements. So this noise constrained LMS we were just talking about is a type of variable step size LMS, but it depends on the data sequence. Uh, there's many other types, and they're based uh, mostly on heuristics. The idea is that you want to choose a step size large initially, so you get fast convergence, and small eventually to, uh, to get a small asymptotic error rate. It turns out, when we looked carefully, that a rigorous anal analysis of the general data-dependent step size was unknown in the literature. In fact, it was just assumed that if the variable step size satisfied the same bounds required for a fixed step size, that it was uh, stable, had the same stability as LMS. And that turns out to be true. It's, it's easily shown. Um, if it's not just fixed step size, but a deterministic step size. But all the popular versions of the variable step size LMS, including the NC LMS, were actually not just variable, but data dependent. It's a difficult problem to analyze this because uh, unlike the fixed or variable non-data dependent case, you can't get uh, a recursion in the weight error covariance. So what we were able to do was to determine some nonlinear difference equations, which were satisfied by certain bounds on the weight error covariance, bounds which were uniform over an entire class of uh, data-dependent step sizes. For example, prior ones with prior dependent meaning, they depend on the data up to the previous time, and posterior, a data-dependent, which depended on data up to the current time. That was the key. We were then able to analyze these equations, determine stability regions, uh, and, we were, and we showed that the stability region for a data-dependent step size can actually be strictly small than the fixed step size, contrary to, uh, to the usual assumptions which are in the literature. So uh, a little bit of detail on this. Um, here's the general form of the uh, variable step size LMS. Alpha k is the uh, data, generally data dependent step size. So we let script A denote this class of step size sequences I was talking about. So it could be fixed, deterministic, prior data dependent, or posterior data dependent. And then we let S subscript A be the step size intervals um, for which the weights were mean square bounded for all step size sequences in that class uh, which satisfied, which lied in the, uh, the interval. We call this the mean square stability region for the, uh, the class of step size sequences, script A. Now it's known that for um, Stationary independent Gaussian data, strong assumptions in this constructive approach. The, uh, the stability region for the fixed step sizes is just uh, basically the step size intervals which are bounded above by some parameter alpha star, where alpha star can be characterized in terms of the eigenvalues of the, uh, uh, the uh, covariance of the, re of the regressor. And it's also um, easy to show that this this chain of uh, inclusions hold. So what we showed first for the uh, case of a single tap is that the stability region for the prior step size was the same as for the fixed step size. But the stability region for the posterior step size was strictly contained in the uh, stability region for the fixed step size. And then when we looked at what turned out to be a much harder problem with multiple taps, uh, we were able to get bounds on the prior and the posterior step size regions, still we were able to show that the posterior step size was strictly contained in the uh, stability region for the fixed step size. So uh, here's an example of this. The stability region for the fixed step size is just this kind of um, triangular region here. This point here is alpha star. The, this axis is the upper bound. But for so any, any step size, which was less than alpha star for the fixed step size. Step size would be uh, mean square stable. The stability region for the uh, posterior step size is, uh, is now bounded away from the region for the fixed step size. And it's kind of interesting because uh, it shows as the uh, 
as the upper limit, this is the upper limit on the step size interval, gets larger, so does the lower limit on the step size interval. Okay, right? I mean, the lower limit on the step size interval for this value, the upper limit is here. But, you know, if you're here, it's here. So this interval is kind of getting more narrow. Okay? And actually, as the upper limit on the step size interval approaches the maximum value, so does the lower limit. Which means that if you want to get, uh, say, choose the maximum um, step size, say, to get the largest uh, rate of convergence, you essentially have to choose a fixed step size, okay? Because there's no, there's no wiggle room between the lower and the upper limit once you choose such a large step size. In the multi-tap case, um, we were able to get bounds. Uh, the figure on the left shows uh, uh, such bounds for uh, minimal eigenvalue spread and, and on the right for uh, a considerable eigenvalue spread. Okay, so um, that's all I wanted to talk about in detail, and I want to talk about some other uh, stuff briefly. So. Uh, so I wanted to discuss some stuff which I've spent a lot of time on here at Purdue. In fact, uh, realistically, at least half my career, probably more. But I've since moved on the last several years to this uh, stuff I was talking about previously, or maybe moved back to it, um, machine learning, pattern recognition, statistics, optimization, although there is some overlap. So this other work uh, involved a lot of work with optimal and near-optimal model-based methods. Uh, all kinds of variants of AR and ARMA models, Markov, hidden Markov, hidden semi-Markov, state-space models, things like that. And there was a, uh, this is a list, I'm not going to read these, this is a list of some of the things that I worked on. Or maybe I'll mention the, 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 the last two. One was um, this uh, ethanol concentration and pattern recognition from an implantable biosensor. Oh, I should say something about funding, I guess. So this was funded by a, uh, an NIH R01 grant. And uh, uh, most recently, this harmonic spectral analysis and pattern recognition from probe passive devices, which was uh, funded by an, an Army Murray uh, grant. This other earlier work was actually funded by, uh, by NSF. And also the work I was discussing uh, about adaptive algorithms and stochastic approximations, that was also funded by NSF, but also by, um, by the Army Research Office under a core grant. I also got some high-performance computers from them uh, under their Dura program. And uh, I think around the year 2000, I actually had the, uh, the most powerful uh, compute servers in the department. And uh, uh, I remember actually the department head at the time asking me for accounts on those machines for some of the incoming faculty. Kind of a funny story. Okay. Um, anyway. Okay. Uh, Another area I've, I worked on, and mostly, work, mostly uh, uh, moved on from, although I have some regrets because this area has is, is now become very active again. Um, so I've done a lot of work on practical problems, and most of it's supported by industry involving modeling, algorithm development, analysis, and lots and lots of simulation of all kinds of uh, different coding and modulation and uh, uh, channels and um, wireless and satellite communications and broadcast systems. Uh, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read uh, through all these. The most recent one is this nonlinear channel coding for uh, satellite channels with uh, uh, Northrop Grumman that went on for a few years. Um, it's kind of an interesting channel model. It's a peak power constrained channel model. 
Oh, one thing I should say is, you know, I had a multi-year relationship with Thompson, initially Consumer Electronics, and then Multimedia before they, uh, they left. And uh, uh, that uh, laid the foundation for writing a fairly large 21st century um, grant. Large at the time, anyway. So I learned a lot from this stuff, but I'm, I'm kind of... Um, returning to the uh, pattern recognition and machine learning area. My interest in this area is in what I've called modern time series analysis, uh, using tools from statistics, uh, machine learning, optimization, and also some model-based single processing. Um, some recent work is discovering these temporal drinking patterns from implantable ethanol biosensor. I already mentioned that. Also, discovering temporal, dietary, and physical activity patterns from surveys and uh, accelerometry. So these are both problems in the health area, and there's a lot of these kinds of problems there. Uh, so we had a little seed grant from NIH for this accelerometry work, but uh, it's been challenging to, to, to get funding. But we have proposals in, and um, we're optimistic. On the theoretical side, I'm interested in developing and analyzing uh, classification regression trees, um, both the sort of pruning with the single tree and the averaging uh, and, and, you know, with the ensembles of trees for uh, classification and prediction of time series. And then also uh, developing and analyzing dynamic time warping for comparing and uh, clustering sparse time series. So uh, dynamic time warping is a, is a method to uh, compare time series which are sort of running at different rates, which is the kind of thing which happens a lot when people are involved, like when they speak or, uh, or eat or move. And um, some of these time series are quite sparse. Sparseness uh, can kind of arise in, in various ways. One is, um, you know, there's like a m missing measurement. Okay, maybe there's a sensor or somebody doesn't answer a questionnaire. Um, that typically isn't a lot of sparseness. Okay, that's a kind of a rare event. Uh, but the other way it can arise is you can have kind of lots of zeros in a time series record. These would be periods where people aren't speaking or maybe they're not eating or moving. And that's actually very significant. And uh, so that's what we're looking at trying to understand, you know, uh, the fundamental limits and practical algorithms for, um, for dealing with that kind of sparseness while maintaining the uh, near optimality, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the dynamic time warping criteria. So we just had a paper accepted on this subject at um, one of the more prestigious um, machine learning workshops. And uh, I'll see how that goes. Okay, so I've got a couple of pages of uh, references. I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Interesting history. You guys have any questions? Criteria right. To do you have the code for this? Are you willing to share the code for? Uh... We do. Okay. Yeah. So I'll pay you on that. We do. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I can't uh, guarantee that it's in great shape. <laughs> okay. But we do. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.